Hi, everyone, and welcome to our short session on engaging consumers with the latest shelf innovations. My name is Stephanie Horowitz, and I'm the Value Creation Manager at SAPIO Foundry Tel Aviv. So we know there have been a lot of changes in the consumer industries from retail to CPG because of COVID, digital transformation taking over our world, lots of elements of our lives. Today, we wanted to give you a 20 minute one stop shop, haha, <laughs> get it shop, with a group of experts. We're going to be talking about the latest trends and changes in the industry, as well as how to best engage consumers. We'll be hearing from two talented startups who are helping large consumer products companies and retailers succeed in doing so. So, today, our speakers are from SAP, Nielsen, Arpalus, and SRP. A little bit of context we're all connected. Uh, Arpalus and SRP are both of our portfolio companies, and by R, I mean SAP and Nielsen. So we're really excited to share these insights with you together in this forum. So we're going to quickly go through the agenda so everyone knows what's in store for today. So first, a welcome, which is now. And after me, we'll be hearing from Kevin Klopatik on in-store condition changes from the COVID-19 pandemic. Then we'll be hearing from Mark Osborne on reimagining the shopper shelf relationship. We'll move into retail execution using computer vision with Ophir Zilberbert. And finally, disrupting the neighborhood grocery market with Gil Rabinovich, and then we will wrap it. So that's what we have in store for today. So first we're gonna be hearing from Kevin and Kevin is the North America Display Causal Leader for Nielsen IQ. So Ke Kevin, please feel free to take it from here. Good morning. Um, hello, wherever you are. Uh, we're, our, uh, I'm with uh, Nielsen IQ. Um, I've been with them for a very long time, uh, but 35 years, most of it in the field collection space. So we're, we visit about 9,000 stores in the US and about 1,200 in Canada every week and collect in-store um, display data from, these, from, from the stores. And so we're just gonna talk a little bit about some of the changes we've seen in the last year as we've moved through these stores. So uh, sort of in a general trends um, mode, uh, we see that the big stores were more prepared for the click and collect, the click and collect the uh, different types of e-commerce um, that consumers now demand. And this has really gone a long ways to start squeezing out some of the smaller local chains. Um, they've had to come up with some ideas of you know merging or or just out and out closing in a lot of cases. So we're seeing more store closures from the independent and um, small retailers than we had seen in previous years. Um, there's definitely been a huge acceleration in the e-commerce space, um, somewhere in the six to 10 year range, thanks to the use of online shopping, pickup and delivery, Instacart, um, et cetera. Um, grocery sales are well up in most stores. Um, this you know, is offset by a pretty big reduction in restaurant sales. People still are eating the same amount of food. They're just getting it in a different way. Um, we're seeing a huge uptick in the um, meal kit space, both by meal delivery services and store brands. Um, other general trends, we, we've sort of, we've seen some other things happen. So in some cases, there's limits on what consumers can buy. Um, we've seen massive out of stocks as, as uh, demand for products out, outpaces display, supply, supply chain problems. Um, so a, a lot of it has changed what people are buying um, so that maybe they were brand loyal to our product but that product has not been available or it's been difficult for them to find. So they've spent, uh, they've switched to maybe a store brand or an, a different brand and maybe we'll never go back. Uh, we've seen reduced hours of operations as stores close for cleaning. Um, that sort of impacts the, you know, sort of overall sales and certainly impacts employment in those stores. Um, we've seen occupancy limits as a result of, um, COVID um, restrictions. Um, we've seen definitely a giant uptick in the presence of immunity projects, um, you know, elderberry, elderberry emergency, et cetera. Um, we see a lot more of them on display um, than we did previously. 
Um, there's complete elimination of in-store demos and samples related to display and feature items. And many retailers have either scaled back or reduced their weekly feature, um, which impacted what was on display in store. Um, and then we've also seen due to the lower um, number of brands available sometimes that displays have fewer products on them. Um, there's a lot more contactless payment, less contact with staff. There's a, a lot of different ways to pay now that maybe don't involve going through a, a traditional checkout. Um, aisles are one way. So they've made, they've picked up a lot of the on-floor displays to make room for people to move in and out of the, in and out of the stores. Um, In-store and curbside pickup has led to parking changes. So even parking lots have been, had to be restructured. So in a lot of stores, the, you know, the, maybe the closest to store parking is all, um, click and collect or curbside pickup stuff now. Uh, many of the stores had, you know, pre-made fresh options and they've closed those, you know, salad bar type places. Um, a lot of them had like in-store dining areas and they've repurposed that area to be part of the store and taken out the pre-made dining options. Uh, we definitely see a big decline in the number of UPCs per display. So the number of items on each display has changed. Uh, likely due to um, a lot of the staff has been repurposed to do click and collect uh, and and or like e-commerce type options um, or a lot of the staff has been repurposed for cleaning so displays are thrown up quite often in a quicker manner um, there's fewer displays overall a lot of it is the space required for social distancing and the value of in-store displays has potentially declined. And this isn't, we don't have any any evidence of this at this moment from my group, but when we think of think sort of through, a lot of the people that are doing shopping now are not the, the end users of the product. So uh, there's a lot of click and collect, um, you know, e-commerce type shopping organizations that either have their own shoppers or outside organizations doing the shopping and they're shopping from a grocery list and they're buying off the regular shelf and they're not as inclined to even look at displays and certainly aren't influenced by displays. So the value of the displays to the manufacturers and the retailers has changed somewhat. Um, and, and definitely in convenience stores, we're seeing like in a lot of places, it's mandated that they can't pick up a hot prepare or they can't have their hot food sections or a lot of maybe their beverage stations open and stuff that they used to have. So they've limited the amount of display space in the store quite significantly or the amount of people that can be in a store, which has impacted overall shopper behavior. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. We're now going to be moving into uh, Mark Osborne's presentation. And Mark is a global vice president of business development and strategy for SAP Consumer Industries. So Mark, you can go ahead and share your screen, take it away. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and thanks, Kevin. Those are some really great insights that I think speak to some of the changes that we've seen as a result of the pandemic that have actually accelerated some of the broader shifts that we've started to, to see in the consumer products industry that are directly affecting retail. Um, that had been happening perhaps in slow motion prior to the pandemic, but are now happening in, uh, you know, on a much more accelerated rate as a result of some of the changes that we're going through. And the way that we characterize this is, is really a fundamental shift in the industries. You know, it used to be for the last 75 to 100 years, entire industries like consumer products and retail were, were focused on what were called the two moments of truth. Getting a consumer into a store and getting them to buy something and then getting them to take it home and use it and then hopefully repeat that cycle. And that was based on a really well understood linear path to purchase with clearly defined touch points along the way that focused on getting that user to a transaction for a product in a store. And this environment was one where all the value, uh, all the, uh, the players in the value chain were really well defined. So retailers were retailers, and consumer products companies were consumer products companies and wholesalers were wholesalers. And it favored a model of economies of scale. And this is not the model that we're in anymore. This is not the game we're playing. The game we're playing is now fundamentally different. 
And today it's all about moments of opportunity and really developing a much more holistic understanding of the journey that that consumer is on and the experiences that are required to help that consumer on the way toward achieving an outcome. Consumers today don't wanna to buy something as much as they want to achieve something. They don't wanna be sold to, they wanna be assisted and guided and helped. And this requires thinking more broadly about not only the experiences you have to deliver, but the ecosystems that you have to assemble in order to serve the needs of that consumer. Because you may be thinking beyond just the products that you sell in a particular store environment to things like content or services or other non-traditional channels where you meet, may meet consumers. And this model favors what we call economies of speed. Those companies that can identify those moments the most quickly and assemble the best experiences to help that consumer achieve an outcome are going to be the ones that win. And in this model, the store is still important, um, but it is not the focus of the engagement. The store becomes just one potential touch point in a much larger engagement strategy for consumer products and retailers. And I think many of the things that you heard Kevin mention in the previous presentation sort of point to that, where we see a dramatic uptick in e-commerce or you know, the rise in click and collect type of services. Um, we're seeing the blending of physical and virtual experiences that may include a store, but might help facilitate you know, some of the things that Kevin mentioned, like helping a consumer move to that store more quickly by maybe engaging with them earlier in the process to develop a different kind of shopping list um, that can still help them discover new products, but maybe in a way that they wouldn't um, in the midst of the pandemic, whereas previously they do that inside of a store. And this is happening across every major segment in, in the consumer products industry. And Nike is one great example of this. And I love this quotation. This, this was actually a couple of years ago um, in, in, in a press release they put out when they acquired a data science company. And you think of you know, Nike as a fashion and apparel company. What are they doing acquiring a data science company? And this is really telling. They say, our goal is to serve consumers more personally at scale. We have to anticipate demand. We don't have six months to do it. We have 30 minutes. And I'm willing to bet if you revisited that quote with that executive today, they'd say it was actually less than 30 minutes today. Um, it's, it's accelerating at such a dramatic rate. And the most important piece of this picture is not the store that's in the background, it's the phone that's in this consumer's hand. Because today the store is not just the physical environment, it is wherever that consumer happens to be. And companies like Nike, who have been early to recognize this opportunity around direct to consumer engagement, have vastly outperformed other benchmark companies in the consumer products industry. And you can see that as reflected in their stock price performance relative to the likes of companies like P&G and Kraft Heinz and Newell, um, who are all, again, benchmark companies in consumer products, um, but have not been as early on as companies like Nike in, in making the investments in direct, in direct to consumer engagement. So specific to store-based opportunities, we see a variety of things happening that are represented by specific examples here. And I think there's, a, there's just another great quote that, that really sums up what's happening. You know, we don't think retail is dead. The rise of e-commerce will not ultimately replace the physical retail store, but we think mediocre retail is dead. So the idea is how can you leverage some of these digital technologies to blend that physical and virtual environment to improve that consumer's experience in the store um, while engaging with them in an environment that might be virtual outside of that store. So a couple of representative examples um, of you know, customers and partners of SAP. So for example, we're working with a company called ScanTrust that works with Unilever. They run a pilot in Vietnam where they have a proprietary Q QR code technology that they've developed that they can uh, um, apply to a package. And if the consumer scans that package, whether they're in a store or at, at home, they can see all of the traceability information about the products or the ingredients that go into that product. So in this case, it's the pork that goes into the soup and it's certified as organic and sustainably um, sourced. But what this also creates is a channel for Unilever now to communicate directly with that consumer as a result of that scan. So for example, if the consumer were standing in a store and made the scan to confirm that that pork was organic and sustainably sourced prior to making the purchase, Unilever could push an offer to that consumer to help facilitate that transaction immediately in that store environment. And the same thing could happen at home and to do that as a, to encourage repeat purchase and, and to, to revisit the store. In another example, a number of years ago, SAP made a strategic investment in a company called Vivanda, which developed a product called Flavor Print. And this is a spin out from the McCormick company, which is a longstanding company in consumer products. And, and you know, over the last few years has realized that they've got over 150 years worth of consumer research into consumer preferences when it comes to taste and texture for food. And so, 
they have developed a product that allows you to develop what is essentially your own personal flavor print, which gives you the opportunity to then discover like products that have similar flavor profiles to those products that you normally purchase and would give you then the opportunity to download a recipe and then make suggestions to consumers to say, if you like this particular product, you may like these other products that we can suggest to you. And that might facilitate that consumer's movement through the store as they discover those. And then finally, we're working with another company called Pop Wallet that is working with one of our customers, Mars. They're leveraging e-wallets to encourage sharing loyalty and trial by um, enabling consumers to give the gift of a Snickers bar, which a consumer can uh, um, redeem either in a store or through a direct-to-consumer engagement. But again, it encourages that trial and encourages a consumer to visit a store to redeem that offer and then creates that direct um, opportunity for further engagement with that consumer. So these are just a few representative examples, but again, the idea is blending the physical and virtual environment to create that direct to consumer engagement and hopefully expand the value of that consumer's experience as they move through that process of trying to achieve an outcome. So with that, I'll hand it back to Stephanie and we can introduce our two startup partners. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, definitely craving a Snickers bar right now. <laughs> that sounds really good. Um, we're going to move into our two startups, as we mentioned before. So first, we're going to be hearing from Ophir Zilberberg, who is the co-founder and CEO of Arpalus, his presentation, Retail Execution, Using Computer Vision. So Ophir, please feel free. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Steph. Uh, thanks again. My name is Ophir, as uh, Steph uh, uh, presented, CEO and co-founder at Arpalus. And Arpalus is an Israeli-based uh, uh, company. Uh, operating in the retail space, helping uh, consumer packaged goods and retailers to solve some of the biggest problems uh, between digital and physical. And let me show you what we are doing. Uh, first of all, we are enabling computer vision and augmented reality, and we use it at the edge. Uh, this is very crucial that I will explain in the next uh, few slides. We use it on any device to close the retail gap uh, between the physical and the digital. And what we've seen in the past uh, uh, year or so uh, is that we saw a new real, new dynamics that really reflect on retail, really reflect on uh, consumer pro product uh, companies. From a 1.2 trillion to 1.8 trillion dollar of retail distortion, uh, mainly due to availability issues. Some of them were covered in the previous uh, presentations, uh, but also, or the main part of it, is out of stock the availability issues. More than that, everything is starting to become more local. Stores are becoming uh, uh, smaller and uh, convenience stores are uh, uh, rapidly increasing their, their chains. And this uh, uh, makes an immense operational effort or creates an immense operational effort on consumer packaged goods companies that hold huge staff in many locations and most of them are still working using manual, or I might say semi-manual work. Arpalus is simply automating all of this. We are helping uh, consumer product uh, companies to optimize their in-store operations, putting a lot of emphasis on product availability to increase the visibility of their products, efficiency and compliance at every point of sale uh, uh, in their uh, um, operations. How we do it, uh, this is a, a quick demonstration video. Uh, an employee just aims the visor towards the shelf and a shelf, uh, kind of an infinite canvas, opens in front of him, uh, helps him scan the shelf entirely. Then after the shelf was scanned, clicking on the finish button, and so within a few seconds, the employee can clearly see the key KPIs and what is going on at every point of sale on the shelf. In this uh, example, you can see that the lights are marking the employees what in, is in place. The yellows are telling the employee, okay, this product is not in place, you should change it. And if uh, the employee zooms in or, or making a, a closer look, they can also see a reflection of the planogram on top of the physical space. Everything is wrapped and aggregated in the report page and uh, allocated to a main uh, dashboard system. 
Top four unique of our technology. First of all, we are a zero friction company. We only use the smartphones or the edge devices. Then uh, we have a really unique self-improving accuracy uh, that you will see it later on, but it, uh, it gives a drama dramatic results of more than 95, sometimes more than 98% on average on various categories. Um, the AI on the edge gives two main capabilities for any uh, CP company. First of all, flexibility. You don't need uh, your employees to be connected to the cloud, connected to Wi-Fi or anything. You can, they can just turn into offline mode and still get all the results. Second thing is a dramatic reduce in the capex uh, of embracing this, this solution. Last, it's real time. And more than that, it's within seconds or sub-seconds. And uh, during some kind of uh, customer experience that I will share with you, uh, 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 in one minute, uh, you will see some other very exciting opportunities that we unlock to our customers, to our partners. So to wrap it, what to expect, really clear static analysis of what is going on on the shelf, on any shelf within seconds and sub-seconds. We're covering out of shelf, out of stock, uh, planned on compliance issues, and we are totally increasing more and more capabilities like a, a stock count and a price compliance and other metrics. And then we are also closing the loop. We are working with a couple of partners to close the loop. That means that we provide them even an assumption, a suggestion of what is the exact uh, number of products and the missing UPCs that they need to order on the spot. In real time, we close the loop. If we are here, and this is the R plus product, we also touch with our in-store data on regional managers, category managers, and even down to the logistics. We help them using the uh, unique in-store data that we collect with the measurements. We offer it or we present it in a very clear way for them to use. Uh, but more importantly, we solve or we automate one of the biggest hurdles when it comes to the point of sale. One story uh, uh, with a CPG uh, a customer, uh, and the, 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 the operational effort was to cover tens of thousands of points of sale every week, every day, with global operations in several countries. The field personnel were capturing uh, this kind of information. It took a lot of time. It was not consistent and it was not accurate. And most of the time they didn't even know whether the information was right or wrong. And the high uh, recognition levels, this is what was another prerequisite by the customer. After a quick process, we got to a rate of on average 98%, including any soft packs, uh, packed uh, snacks, uh, real-time analysis on average less than seven seconds, and the audit duration that was uh, reduced dramatically. And uh, we can see clear results, whether it comes to our very quick and rapid onboarding, but also when it comes to clear results in reducing the, 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 some of the biggest hurdles in the, the operational work, but also in sales uplift and availability of the products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fear. Thank you so much. Last, but certainly not least, our final presentation today will be, whoops, I'm just kidding, I skipped over it. <laughs> It'll be with Gil. Gil Rabinovich, who is the co-founder and CEO of SRP, his presentation, Disrupting the Neighborhood Grocery Market. Stage is yours, Gil. Thank you, Stephanie. Very happy to be here. Yep, so, hello everyone. My name is Gil Rabinovich and I'm the CEO of SRP Analytics, uh, an Israeli-based uh, startup company. In this short talk, I'm going to present how SRP disrupts the neighborhood grocery market and ecosystem. Let's start with the market. We see that consumer behavior shifts from buying at retail chains towards buying from the neighborhood grocery store. This has been accelerating during COVID-19, obviously, making this a global annual market of $4 trillion. At the same time, such neighborhood stores are, are simply lacking any technology and data to manage their stores, their vendors, or their consumers. 
And this in turn create a great opportunity for the CPGs as the retail chains keep, keep challenging them with fierce competition and introduction of white label products. Access to a large number of small stores not only would grow the revenues with higher profit margins, but it would also serve as a strategic move in this competitive landscape. So how can CPGs gain such access to all those small stores while maintaining minimum cost? SRP does exactly that. It engages a network of small stores on one digital retail platform. Each store owner is equipped with an advanced mobile app for managing their entire ecosystem, placing orders with the vendors, receiving orders from consumers, managing inventory, shelves, and assortment. By applying advanced technology, including AI, image recognition, and machine learning, the store owner gets actionable insights and benchmark. For example, inventory status, order predictions and recommendations, information about a, a new product introduction, consumer preferences, insights, and much more than that. From a CPG perspective, in addition to leveraging a very advanced digital platform that allows them to grow their revenues across numerous stores at minimum, minimal sales costs, they also receive lucrative data from shelf photos to insight on which product they should add to store assortment and real-time campaign analysis. Let's have a look at the case study in Israel. We launched SRP in, in this location over a year ago. Today, we're serving nearly 2,000 stores, which is actually 20% of the overall relevant market. We witnessed unprecedented 95% retention, close to none left since inception. In terms of revenues, store using SRP have been generating a 7% increase in revenues for the CPG of this case study, which is fantastic. Add this to 30% efficiency of the sales team and our results are no less than amazing. By joining the SRP platform, both CPGs and neighborhood stores unlock revenues and profit and improve the market position. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gil. And thank you so much, everyone. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful event. We're so happy that we could all come together and do this. Uh, clearly there are a lot of changes going on in the industry and more to come. I think we can all agree that it's very exciting to see new solutions and new technology from young companies leading the way, like our Palouse and SRPR, doing this hand in hand with larger organizations uh, like Nielsen and SAP really shows what we can do when we work together. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's true, everyone. It's pretty awesome stuff. Um, so we thank you all so much. We're really excited to see what's to come. And a quick FYI that SAPIO is actually looking for B2B startups to join our next cohort, which is focused on consumer engagement. So if you know B2B startups with solutions and marketing or e-commerce that are focused on consumer engagement, which is really what we're talking about right now, uh, please feel free to refer them to us or you can apply. You can go to sap.io online for more information. And that's a wrap. So thank you so much, everyone, and stay well. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.